G'day fools, I'm Scott Phillips and welcome to another in our ever-expanding series, my favourite investing books. Now, as I said before, it was going to be book, but a few of our analysts have got a couple they want to talk about. So it's now a longer series than it was going to be, and hopefully you're the winner because there are some great investing books out there. But trying to tell them apart, trying to work out which ones are worth reading, that can be the hard part. Now, I've got Chris Copley with me. G'day, Chris. G'day, Scott. How are you going? Mate, I'm very, very well. I'm very excited. This is the second little book. We've had mentioned in our series thus far. So little book, but big impact. I think the last one was little book that builds wealth. This one is what exactly? This one is the little book of behavioral investing. So yeah, this, this book was written by uh, James Montier and, and, and it basically describes uh, many of the, the key behavioral biases, which, which impact on our ability to, to make rational decisions. So um, this book's just over 100 pages, so, so it isn't that long. Um, it's easy to get through for, for investors at any level. And, and I think it's uh, the most important book for, for investors to read there, as there are just you know, so many traps that we can fall into as investors. And the unfortunate thing is, as many of these traps, uh, we actually uh, uh, dig for ourselves, really, but, but we often we just don't realise they're there. So I think this, got, this book does a, a great job at, at, at defining many of these traps and biases and, and gives a... Uh, um, many clear and, engage, and engaging examples and stories as well to show to show how they impact on us. So, um, mm. a, as well as to help us overcome these biases as well, they help to give examples on how to overcome them, which is great as well. Nice, I love that, mate. This is one of those books. I don't know if it's my favourite investing book, but somewhat um, oxymoronically, maybe it is the one I reckon everybody should read. Maybe that, by definition, should make it maybe the most important investing book. Maybe it's not my favorite investing book, but the most important. And as you said, I, so I listen to this one on an audio book. And if you've listened to me talk about this before, either on one of our podcasts or somewhere else, I've said many, many times, this is, I, I, I listened to it the first time on an audio book and I was literally mowing the lawn. And I reckon mowing the lawn that day took me about twice as long as it normally does because every time I'd stop and go, yeah, that, yeah, that, and I have to get the phone out and I make a little note on my, on my notes app and then I get back to the mowing and as I said, I reckon it took me two and a half hours to get the mowing done. What was otherwise a small lawn back then, um, just because I had to keep stopping all the time. It is such a great book, written beautifully, as you say. Um, so many great examples. And this is the thing. I think investing biases can sound, I say boring, but I say boring. Um, you know, the whole idea of like, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, fine. It just They make it so stupidly clear. James does a wonderful job of, of outlining some of these big biases, the things that can stop us from investing. Mate, so you've given us a nice summary of kind of what, like the kind of the, the ground it covers. Maybe you can give us a couple of, are there a couple of favorite biases you have or maybe least favorite biases, a couple of examples that stood out. Are there a couple of takeaways from the book you can leave our listeners with or our viewers with, I should say? Yeah, absolutely. I, I found, um, well, it's interesting you mentioned your mowing story, Scott, because I had quite a similar <laughs> story as well when I read through the book. So I, I used my Kindle reader actually to, to go through it. And I was nice. going through the book and I'm making notes, highlighting sections. And at the end, I got to it and I was looking through my highlighted notes and it was nearly as long as the book. <laughs> exactly. There's so many great stories nice. just to, to yeah. highlight and go back through and read. Yeah. And and yeah, so a number of great examples are, are provided in this book. So, so one bias that, that particularly stood out to me was uh, was that we look for, for information that, that agrees with us and, 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 uh, and tend to agree with information that supports our original line of thinking. So, so the book gives an example where there's a group of people who were asked to, to read a study on, on the death sentence and had to rate the studies uh, in terms of how it impacted their views. So half the participants were pro-death penalty and the other half were against death penalty. And as it turns out, those who were pro-death penalty thought studies that supported capital punishment were, were well argued and studies against the death penalty were deeply flawed. And, <laughs> and uh, those who were against the death penalty came to the exact opposite conclusion. So yeah, the problem is by, by um, by closing ourselves off to, to other viewpoints or, or evidence that, that our own views could be wrong or, or flawed, we, we could uh, miss critical pieces of information that, that should uh, change our view on a particular investment. And, 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 and beyond that, this, this book also certainly you know, helped help me notice irrationality in my own behaviour. So uh, I'm, I'm a big Brisbane Lions fan, Scott, so I, I watch their game. I'm sorry to hear that, Chris. <laughs> oh, we're doing okay this year. We're doing okay. <laughs> but yeah, when, when, when I watch the Lions win, for example, I'm often thinking yeah. and saying, you know, how good were we? The team played great. <laughs> uh, we're going to make the finals this year, all these positive thoughts. Um, yeah. But, but if, if the team loses, I often finish the game thinking, well, you know, we were a bit unlucky here. You know, if the umpire's call <laughs> went this way or if there was a particular player that wasn't injured or if the ball didn't hit the post, uh, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, the result could have been different. But this, <laughs> this tendency to, to say 
um, a good outcome happen because of skill whilst blaming a bad outcome on, on bad luck. This, this is a, a bias uh, that, that will not be particularly helpful when it comes to, to investing and might actually cause us to learn the wrong lessons. And, and as you know, Scott, it doesn't matter who we are. Um, everyone makes investment mistakes, but, it, but it's important to learn from these mistakes rather than just dismiss it as bad luck. So yeah, this, this book has a whole uh, number of great engaging stories and examples. And I'm sure everyone who reads it will have, will have different biases and examples that really resonate with them. So I really encourage that. It's funny, you know, the, the, one thing I will say, so biases, as you say, it really should be called the little book of life because frankly, these aren't just investing biases, right? They are behavioral investing and you can pretty much put behavioral and put any word after it because if you've ever been on social media, this is social media 101 confirmation bias in particular. Uh, I'm as guilty as anybody that you, know, you like and share the stuff you agree with, you ignore or scroll past the stuff you don't like. Even your football example, mate, is, and this is only one bias, by the way, confirmation bias as of from many, many, many biases that are covered in the book. But I, I used to referee junior rugby league back in the day. And so I've kind of got half an eye on the game as a referee, even when I watch my team play. But even then, you kind of come out of this thinking, oh, the referee got us on these three areas. You don't tend to think, well, like the other team got some bad calls as well. It's always, well, we'll take the bad calls against them, but our bad calls, that cost us the game. And it's all that stuff that it's just, it's just life, right? And that's the other thing is these aren't even... So I guess the first thing is you've got to actually come with an open mind because if you don't want to hear the, the stories of the book, you'll actually fall victim to exactly that of saying, well, that's not me, that's somebody else. I know when I was a, I was a younger bloke, I know we, you know, have you ever seen the movie The Castle? You're old enough to have seen The Castle? Oh, a long time ago, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, when, you were, when you were three. So there's the old story of everyone looking around going, oh yeah, that's so-and-so's family or that reminds me of him. And it's kind of one of those where other people are saying, well, that reminds me of your family. And it's, it's always that thing of you seem to see other, other things in other people, maybe not in ourselves. Um, so great, fantastic book, fantastic, uh, I think, opportunity for enterprising investors, for open, aware investors. Just have a look at themselves. You've really got to start, though, with a, a pretty open mind, right? You have to, you have to start. And this is maybe the, the paradox of learning about behavioral investing. If you start with a closed mind, it can't help you, which is almost the irony, right? Because they, they talk about confirmation bias. And then you read about it. If you're not open to the fact it might be you as well, you'll actually learn zero from the book. I've certainly talked to people who have looked at behavioral investing and gone, oh yeah, that's other people. Now I know what the rest of the market's like. I'm like, oh dude, you've missed the point. It's about me. It's about you as much as it's about anybody else. So you've got to start with an open mind. Matt, are there any other biases that kind of jump out? Is there one more maybe you can kind of highlight and, and share with our viewers? Yeah, I found, I found another one interesting to be the, I guess, the sunk cost fallacy. So, yes. so often if, if we're looking uh, at an investment, so it might be something that we've already done. So yep. that they go into an example of investment that they've already already paid for 90% of the investment. Um, mm -hmm. They heard that another business was, was already going to come in and uh, invest in that same area. It had come in with a superior product, but you still have 10% left of the investment to, to finish mm -hmm. that product that you were looking to, to design. So... Uh, a, a lot of people, if they are asked the question, what to do with that 10%, but if you already saw a better alternative product out there, would you just continue to finish the investment that you, you're already initially going to make? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these uh, in individuals came out and said, well, yes, we'll use that 10% to finish the product. <laughs> but if you, if you phrase the question in a different way and say, well, we've got 10%, so if it's a $10 million investment, mm -hmm. you've got a $1, $1 million of, um, to invest, you can invest it in this product where you know, there's already a, a competing product out there which is superior to the one we're looking to create, or you could find a, a different alternative for that $1 million investment, then the, the answers of the individuals completely change to, well, let's look for something different. So, so I, I think that that's another uh, important bias to keep in mind as well. When we look at our investments, if, if there's a particular, particular company that, that we already own, uh, we don't necessarily need to keep doubling down on that investment if we think that things have changed. We can we can look elsewhere. So I think that's a, that's another. But there's there is plenty more as well, Scott. <laughs> I, I love that example, mate. This is one. It kind of it kind of correlates with the endowment effect as well. These who are really close in investing, and it's the idea. I, I think one of the ways I've I've talked about and heard about doing this is imagine your entire portfolio went to cash tonight or tomorrow night, depending on what day you're watching this. The end of the market. And then tomorrow morning, you had to reinvest all that cash back in the market. Would you buy the same companies in the same proportion? And if the answer is no, then it tells you what you should be buying and selling, right? It's so tempting to kind of go, well, I bought CBA and I'm up, I'm, you know, 400% and I'm doing really well. And so I'm going to keep it because I'm up really well, doing well. And you say, well, okay, if I, if I took your entire portfolio and sold it today, would you buy as many CBA shares back tomorrow morning? And sometimes the answer is yes, and that's great. I'm not picking on CBA. Sometimes the answer is, well, no, no, of course not. So, right. So explain to me again why you would, and 
it, it, as you say, reframing, this is one of those, I'm glad you brought it up, mate. This is one of those great solutions to investing biases. And when you read the book, reframing the question, as you say, rather look at the $9 million you've lost, look at the million dollars you haven't yet spent and say, what would I do with that cash? Look at your portfolio and say, well, I already own that now, but if I didn't, what would I buy? And it's a really, really strong, really impressive way that you can just simply with changing the framing. You don't have to do anything else. Just literally change the framing. It can change the whole question. Hopefully, the whole answer that you bring. There's a million, well, it's not really, there's, there's probably a dozen more ideas in this book. Well, well worth reading. I reckon it's one of those books, frankly, even though you know the answers, probably worth reading every year or two. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I only, it was only a few months back where I topped up and had another read over it oh, again. Nice, and, yeah. and you learn new things from it every time and, and you recognize new mistakes that you <laughs> made since the last time you read the book. So I yeah. think it's, it, it's important and, and it's easy for, for investors of, of any level as well. So I, I definitely encourage it for, for, for something that whether or not you're just beginning reading it for the first time, or if you have been investing for a long time, um, yeah, keep touching back on it and make sure that you're, you're looking at yourself as well and understanding whether or not you're falling into some of these traps. So true, mate. Hey, thank you for the book recommendation. Uh, Fools, Chris is a very, very smart, capable investor and a bloke who knows his own mind and understands the biases that, that confront us all. That's what makes him such a great investor. So mate, thank you for spending the time with us viewers. Thank you for watching. If you do like this video and you want to see more, we are adding more to our favorite investment books playlist. You can find that on our YouTube channel, which is where you're watching this. Please do subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell because when you do that, the next one of these that comes out or the next stock of the week or the next stocks in focus, we're putting a heap of content on our YouTube channel. It is growing like the clappers. Uh, so you want to make sure you see all the great content for free, by the way that we're delivering Chris and his, his, his colleagues and my colleagues in the investment team at The Motley Fool. We're going to put a heap of stuff up and you don't want to miss it. In the meantime, and until next time, full on.